Okay, good morning. Thank you all for joining us bright and early this morning. Uh, we have a fantastic panel today, uh, bringing a wealth of experience in the cell and gene therapy space. By way of introduction, my name is Amrita Jay Shankar. I head the Cell and Gene Therapy Center at iCubia. We are a dedicated team offering a unique set of products and services focused on preclinical and clinical development and commercialization of cell and gene therapies um, for companies and research institutes. This is day two on the job for me, but I am excited to welcome some familiar faces um, to the panel. Um, and thank you all. So we'll, we'll talk broadly about some of the topics that we have in mind, but we'd like to make this as interactive as possible and open for audience questions at the end as well. Um, and we'll leave plenty of time for that. But I'd like to just kick things off with uh, having the speakers introduce themselves today. So Abla, if you want to go first. Thank you. Uh, my name is Abla Krisi. I'm the Head of Therapeutics Development at uh, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, I've been at CIRM since 2016. I came to CIRM from Janssen Therapeutics, where I was a CMC specialist. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for coming today. Uh, Ethan Abraham. I'm the business head for the cell gene and nucleic acid franchises at Resilience. I uh, joined the company a year ago. Uh, so that's basically half the duration the company has existed. Uh, so I'm considered uh, an old hand. Yeah. Thank you. Haro Hartunian, I'm the founder and CEO of Biocentric, uh, a CDMO uh, located in New Jersey. Uh, we are a fully integrated end to end CDMO uh, offering process development, uh, clinical production, and commercial production. Good morning. I think there's a run on the coffee after last night's reception. <laughs> I'm Alan Moore. I'm Chief Strategy Officer with the Center for Breakthrough Medicines. Uh, the Center for Breakthrough Medicines is a uh, uh, full, uh, fully integrated uh, CDMO associated with uh, the, the advance of advanced therapies and built to uh, move products from clinical to commercial uh, and um, uh, beyond. So good to meet you all. Uh, so my name is Nicholas Ostrout. I am a senior director in our commercial and corporate development team for our CGT portfolio at Charles River. Uh, I've been at Charles River for about six months now. I was at Lanza before that. Um, Charles River has uh, made a recent play into the manufacturing space with the acquisition of a number of companies in plasmid vector and cell manufacturing. And we obviously have paired that with our portfolio of discovery safety uh, in our testing in our uh, CRO, so. Yeah, thank you all. Um, so clearly, we've got, we've got a great panel, and uh, you know, these are some of the fastest growing CDMOs that we have um, in this space, but I wanna just kick things off by starting to talk you know, with, about how did we actually get here, right? And you know, to, to, to discuss the evolution of CDMOs a bit, and maybe Alan, I'll start with you. Yeah, I have the most gray hair, so I can certainly <laughs> comment on evolution. Um, it's kind of Darwinian in a sense. Uh, I look back and I started at BioReliance in the early 80s with the, the first biotherapeutic products and actually was involved in the first gene transfer experiment in 1989. Um, at that time, the company was, in, was very specialized. Uh, it was entirely funded by government contracts with the National Cancer Institute and it was a specialist laboratory. And I think that was the, the trend at the time. Um, subsequently, uh, it, it added uh, manufacturing capabilities. And now, as part of uh, uh, Merck, uh, EMD, Sigma, whatever the, the, the aggregate is, um, is providing services that range from early preclinical work, toxicology, uh, clinical manufacturing, commercial manufacturing, design, and uh, construction of facilities, project management and transfer of those programs to uh, back to the, the client companies. So there has been an evolution from specialist uh, functions, CDMOs, to broad-based uh, comprehensive uh, CDMOs that, that offer services across the entire spectrum. And I think that uh, that has created um, value uh, for innovator companies, but it also is, is very challenging. 
and making sure that the capabilities across all of those, all of those uh, different areas of expertise are appropriately managed, and that, that can sometimes be a challenge. So, um, you know, going forward, I see uh, migration in the, in the uh, integration and project management and, and transparency that's necessary for innovator companies to, to actually have confidence that the end-to-end -end solution uh, is, is actually going to be successful for their, for their product. Mate, yeah. go ahead. So I was just going to add that, um, you know, I think in the mammalian world where uh, CDMOs are uh, prevalent, uh, it's mostly capacity, right? So companies need extra capacity, they go to CMO, they get the capacity. The processes themselves are not that complicated. Obviously, there's some innovation, for instance, at the time, the GS line from, uh, from Lonza, but, um, but I think with cell and gene, it's different. With cell and gene, because of the diversity of cell types, the diversity of processes, the complexity, uh, I think we're getting to a place where in many cases, CDMOs know how to do this better probably than anyone else. So I think it's also even big pharma in some cases are coming to CDMO to do things because they just don't have the, the in-house expertise. Uh, and this, that's not a change over time, but I think that's a, an interesting evolution of uh, CDMOs from, from being just to extra capacity to being now experts in these fields and being able to manufacture efficiently. I'll just add something at a different angle. Uh, as an entrepreneur, I, I always uh, told the startups that uh, they don't have to build infrastructure, they don't have to hire people, they don't have to build facilities. Uh, CDMOs, they should be partners with small biotech underserved uh, companies, because uh, that's really, CDMO, they have been around for a long time. I mean, I personally used CDMOs six, seven years ago for a cell therapy company. Uh, so I think uh, CDMOs play a very important role uh, in helping small startup biotech companies, cell engine therapy companies, to develop their product and take them to the next step. So, so yeah, if I, I also can say something about the fact that CERM, again, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, through its public-private partnership, has decided then to. Uh, pull together an industry resource uh, alliance for the CDMOs in order to enable a number of applicants that we see on a regular basis, either academic or small industry, or for that ma matter, pharma, uh, to actually proceed with knowing exactly what needs to be done so it's a way to accelerate, also a way to enable growing new people, CDMOs hire also a lot of new people who need to learn, and then also to build like an infrastructure within uh, California and the rest of the US that will have all that expertise. So we're all behind it, and we recently put out a press release saying that now we have Novo Nordisk, we have a, a number of the people on the panel here are also involved, and so it is really important to recognize when we talk to the regulators, uh, manufacturing is a real bottleneck. And we as a team, all of us in the room, as well as the panel, need to figure out how to overcome that in order to get those therapies to patients. Right. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's been a bottleneck. And also the early stages of industrializing manufacturing is not necessarily economical. And, uh, as, as others pointed out, you know, the state supports some of this, but all of you have really creative partnerships as well ongoing, whether it's with academic clinical centers or other industry partners. So I wonder if you could comment on that trend as well and talk about how do we improve the crosstalk between the various players and how do we streamline the process and accelerate the process through <coughs> partnerships, including CRO, CDMO partnerships. I, I, I can start. I mean, and in Biocentric, we have uh, many technological partnerships with the technology developers. I think technology de developers play a very important role in, in, in taking the cell and gene therapy uh, manufacturing to the next level. Uh, process automation, uh, PAT systems, uh, digitization. Uh, really, that's partnership that we have, we as a CDMO, we have to create with the technology developers and help the companies to get their product faster, 
better and, and have the patient access. So that's what we, the part that you guys suggest. Yeah, I want to maybe focus on two, two elements that you mentioned. One is uh, early stage biotech, especially in the current uh, financial environment, it's, it's difficult to raise and everyone's trying to conserve cash. Uh, so, so one element is, of this is, I think, as was mentioned, building partnerships, not necessarily arm's length fee for service, but partnerships long term. And one way that we like to facilitate that is to create value share structures where we reduce the early cash burn for the early company. And then obviously, uh, you know, their outcomes later or upside later, but we want to make sure that uh, we're vested and aligned in incentives in terms of the success of the company and the therapy. So that's from the startup standpoint. From the clinical academic center standpoint, I think that's a critical element, right? So a lot of these therapies, most of them are coming out of academic clinical uh, centers. And to your point, I think we have to get better at implementing the right manufacturing pro processes and platforms earlier on. So later it doesn't get stuck with comparability and all these other complications, and also COGS, right, that are not unsustainable. So we're creating these partnerships with clinical academic centers like MD Anderson and Mayo, Mayo Clinic so that we can help them uh, really implement the right manufacturing platforms and manufacturing methods as early as possible, ideally before going into first in human. Yeah, and I think Eitan, I mean, just to further your point, I, I mean, you make such a, a critical point for the role that academic centers play in this development because the translation is critical. I mean, we see that CMC trips up, um, you know, the CGT um, therapeutics more than any other biologics or, um, so it's really getting, making sure that those processes that are coming out of academia sort of have an eye with, with going, you know, to late stage pivotal to commercial manufacturing. So I think that's really critical that, um, you know, that we, we bring that expertise to those academics to really start thinking about long term and where is this therapy going. So. Yeah. I, you know, I would, I would comment that, you know, there's a kind of a bifurcation. Uh, <clears throat> there's the technology partnering, which is critically important. And we have, I think, 17 different uh, technology partnering initiatives underway. Um, the second is the academic uh, link, and that's critical in the sense of, of uh, understanding not just the manufacturing platform, but also the analytical tools that are necessary to appropriately evaluate you know, the products. And um, we've established a relationship with uh, Penn, uh, Jim Wilson's group, the Viral Vector Corps is actually moving onto our campus and has uh, uh, taken over uh, a building uh, on the uh, uh, campus. And so there's that uh, connection. There's also a manufacturing partnership and that the mm -hmm. early assets that are being developed, uh, you know, uh, at the academic center are actually being manufactured uh, side by side with the, the GMP commercial ready kind of uh, approach. Um, and I, I think that's only going to expand. We're, we're continuing to look at academic partnerships and, and uh, establishing an outlet for these very um, critical, critical products. Uh, we're also looking at establishing outlets for uh, the NIH. And, and today, the NIH is actually hamstrung. Uh, they're not able to manufacture products for across their institutes, and they're putting products on the shelf. Uh, they literally cannot build manufacturing capacity on campus without an act of Congress, and there's no place to build. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there are innovations and rare diseases that are going, uh, uh, you know, astray, and uh, I think all of us are, are working to establish those manufacturing partnerships and, and development partnerships that are going to be so critical. Yeah, there is an opportunity though for the CDMOs to actually recognize that diversity is good, but at the same time specializing and collaborating and getting things done to get them out the door for the patients is needed. That's right. It's really needed. And for that purpose, I think CDMOs, uh, you can you know, decide on uh, building new technologies, helping others, et cetera, but if there is a path towards seeing there are important projects that really need to get to the patients, how do we recognize them? 
can we collaborate in getting them out there okay. and make this happen? This will help everyone. It will not help any one CDMO alone. It will help the whole field. And so that's what we aim to go after together. And this is why CIRM is acting as the conduit for putting together academics with industry as well as for nonprofit with for profit with uh, providing the right resources to jumpstart all that effort. I think one thing I can add is that uh, the CDMOs, uh, well, any, any uh, PIs in hospital or medical center or, or academic centers, they develop something, an IP, and, and the VCs, they come and take it and, and form a company. And, and those guys who are the inventors, they get a little bit of action, you know, a piece of action. And, and I think if the CDMOs can directly work with the inventors, with the medical centers or universities, and, and, and actually, uh, to help them to develop their product, they will add value, and then when the time comes that VCs they come to license, the valuation is higher. So we can play a very important role to improve the valuation of the technologies that the medical centers, hospitals are developing by working with them directly. <clears throat> Do they have the money to support the expenses that, the, of course, for process development and manufacturing? The big hospitals are multi-billion dollar you know, entities. They have the money. So I think that's very crucial. Because when you um, license a technology uh, as an entrepreneur, then, then PI, they don't know what's going on with the technology, what they're doing with it. But I think that's, <clears throat> that's very crucial to, to, to uh, support innovation directly with the PIs in the, in the centers. Right. And I think that's where some of the state support comes to offset those costs as well, but we agree Correct. That's, that's great. Yeah. Um, and some of you already brought this up, so I'll just go to that. So it's clear that you know, quality and analytical testing is also evolving uh, with, alongside product development. Um, and as we follow the sort of approvals and the clinical trial whole track record in this field, it's really clear that you know, analytics are key to this. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on how you address this for your clients and you know, how do you see this evolve as well? Yeah, I can uh, <clears throat> say a couple things there. So first of all, I think our analytics tools currently in cell and gene are pretty primitive, generally speaking, right? I mean, we do flow cytometry, flow cytometry, we do ELISAs, but you know, the deeper understanding of the biology of the cells, the mode of action, those things are not fully developed. And there are tools out there that would enable us today to do a lot more, but it's not done often, right? So. We're definitely focused on building out those capabilities. And also to start to, one thing that's also really missing is capturing the data, right? I mean, making sure we're capturing all the data, we're analyzing all the data, and we're trying to find those correlation, correlations between starting material process and clinical outcome, right? And that's something, by the way, that could, in principle, maybe be, be something pre-competitive, where there's, a, there's a, you know, people are working together on. But it's not, uh, it's not trivial, but it has to be done. Uh, that's one element. The second element is that these processes, or even the QC we currently run, is so expensive and time consuming. Right? Especially for autologous therapies, it's not sustainable and it's not doable. So we have to find ways to have better, faster, cheaper essays. And that's going to be something that also the regulators obviously have to sign off on. So we'll have to accumulate the appropriate data to support those types of essays. I, I tend to agree with you. I think the data, uh, we, we gather data from the day that the patient goes to the hospital until we do the manufacturing, send the product back to the hospital for infusion. There's so much data there, but we have to convert the data into information. Uh, and I think uh, tools that we have today, uh, like Industry 4.0, uh, digital twin uh, type of uh, uh, applications, and we do that in biocentric. Uh, to, to study, uh, to optimize the process, uh, advanced, for example, uh, scheduling uh, that will help us uh, and use AI to help us schedule the equipment, materials, supply chain, all those things are, are, are very important. Uh, I, I'm talking futuristic, but I think eventually <clears throat> the cell engine therapy manufacturing is moving toward that direction, closed system, uh, fully automated, uh, and I think we just have to focus on data. And I think the data is, we have so much data, we don't know what to do with those data. Yeah, I, I 
comment that uh, uh, we're actually funding uh, sponsored research agreements to develop the next kind of generation of analytical tools. We're working, for instance, in the AAV space with um, uh, Blake Paul and uh, his uh, bio bioanalysis group uh, for analytical ultracentrifugation to, to characterize the empty full uh, capsid or an empty full uh, ratio for, for vector. Um, and, and that has to continue. And, and uh, again, it's part of the collaboration with the academic centers that are, that are really up to uh, at the top of their game in terms of uh, analytics. The other, the other component which I think is important is um, establishing um, uh, systems which limit the variability for uh, particularly for autologous products. And that really means going to the source, going to the, the donor, uh, it's, uh, the donor, uh, the initial processing. And we're looking at establishing processing centers that can uh, do the kind of the day one process um, within hours of the collection. And it's been shown that that provides a much greater um, uh, viability of the product at the end of the day, but also limits the variability that we see for products that are collected across um, centers. And in terms of digitization, uh, Har is exactly right. Uh, we have to capture that data and we need to make sure that we have the means to evaluate the clinical outcomes uh, with the process steps that are, 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 are being applied and, and to manage that uh, optimization of the processing. And, and so it's, it's, it's an exciting time. Uh, we are relatively primitive in terms of some of the tools that we're using today, but we're, we're, we're partnering with uh, companies that are on the cutting edge in terms of limiting, uh, you know, automating the, the uh, processing of samples to limit variability and also um, you know, newer technologies. Uh, we've partnered with Kyogen in, in terms of their digital uh, PCR platform and are applying that uh, in the advanced therapy space. And, and, and it's um, a much higher throughput, higher, um, uh, uh, lower uh, processing time, and it, it points to you know, the efforts to reduce the cost of goods. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. I think the, uh, the definition of insanity for us is that we're starting with vastly different starting material, running the same process and expecting the same results. <laughs> That's not going to happen. So uh, there's going to be, I think, a paradigm shift where uh, we, have, we understand that we have to modify the process real time, uh, given the differences in starting material to get to a product that's high quality and releasable. And that's going to be a, a leap also for the regulators, because they're used to exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. You lock the process, you don't change anything. Because it's the same salt, it's a cho, it's a line, right? But there's going to be a change. So it's a regulatory change. It's also obviously a change in technology and understanding of what we can do during the process to affect the final product. And um, there's a lot of work to do there. I think you know, we're all working on, 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 that, on those aspects, but that's going to be critical. I think we work on, in silos right now. I think if you look at the CDMOs, the company, the inventor, CDMOs, and CROs, right? There is no connection between all the uh, parties involved in the product development. And I think we, we can use digitization to connect everybody together. So a CRO, a clinical trials uh, organization, they can have access to the manufacturing data if something happens with the patient. They can connect the outcome and, and say maybe the assignable cause for failure was that you didn't do uh, uh, a good job in manufacturing. So I think that part is also missing. The connection between all parties involved from day one to the end. Can well, I, I just think, challenge? Oh. Uh, we have heard those kind of scenarios now multiple times over the last five years. What is it going to take for those types of experiments to actually take place and for us to get data? So we need to unify in thinking about Correct. how to implement now, not five years from now. because. I, you know, this variability, quality by design, all, right. all of that has have been companies are for. Companies are there right now. That They have the platforms, that the cloud-based platforms that you can actually, as a CDMO, for example, you can implement that kind of technology 
and, and, and through that, you, you can have access to data this, at the same time, real-time data. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are doing it. Oh, OK, but what are the results? We, we're talking about it right now as though it right. is in the future. No. We need to know the results so Correct. we can act on them. Correct. And yeah. both from the funding part Correct. to the implementing part, as well as really thinking through consistency of design of the product. Regulation, FDA, all exactly. those things, data integrity, all those things, exactly. they have to be addressed. It's not very trivial. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key that we have to address. Yeah, yeah I mean, we're, this is a nascent, uh, I mean, you know, cell and gene is still nascent, right? I mean, it's gonna take a while. Uh, also, the, the FDA is always in catch-up mode because everything's moving so fast and it's difficult. But uh, I think we're gonna get there. And I think a good example from a totally different industry um, uh, Boeing and Airbus, they, you know, they, they collect and share and analyze all the uh, jet en engine data, mm -hmm. right? So they're, they're competitive, obviously, but they do that for the sake of, of safety and, and continuous improvement, mm -hmm. right? So we can get there, but it's, um, it's going to take a while. We also have to identify the right elements, right? Because we're not going to be sharing everything. But there are certain elements, I think, that we should be sharing and, and analyzing together. Maybe well, an outcome of this forum is for to make a pact on how we're going to work together <laughs> to move this uh, whole effort forward. Yeah. It is an nascent uh, area of expertise, but it is still, I mean, cell and gene therapy is the future. We are in a position to, f to make a difference now for the future. We'll do it. We'll just apply for a CERN grant. That's not too yeah. funny. You can't. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nick, did you want to? Well, no, I was just going to respond to Albla. I mean, we, you know, I was just having this conversation with somebody yesterday about you know, slowly, almost slowing down. We, we've been talking about the consistency of starting with CLA and how we need to evaluate this and we need to have a more consistent product. Um, and evaluate that, but we've just been, as a field, I think, or as an industry, so rushing to just get to that clinic, treat those patients with whatever's working. Um, I think we need to kind of maybe step back and, you know, actually do some of that deeper science that uh, is, is required. Um, just to get back to the original question, I mean, I think what's been wonderful at Charles River is just having that CRO and CDMO connection has been really beneficial because you have the subject matter experts in safety. Uh, in testing and now in manufacturing, and they can all talk together. And so um, it really brings a, a unique perspective um, to be able to push, you know, what, what are those next analytics that are required, um, you know, even as early as what we're learning from the animal studies that we're doing um, before we get to sort of the, you know, final process. So Nick, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. I think you said that we have to step back and do some science. <laughs> Patients are dying. They need the therapy. We don't have time. Time is of the essence. So uh, I don't know how to address that question. I mean, there are a lot of issues, challenges that we as a manufacturer is facing. But just slowing, is, slowing down, I think that's not fair to the patient, in my view. Well, I mean, we could probably develop a better therapy to treat more patients or more effectively. Um, no, I, I, I think you're not stopping. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be in parallel, right? Things are going to happen in parallel because yeah, they, they have to. Right? So no one's going to stop. I mean, the driver, the driver for the industry and for the Patient. investment is the clinical data, right? I yeah. mean, that, that's the bottom line. Uh, so it's going to keep happening as long as we see positive clinical data, which is great to see. There's going to continue to be a push to get into patients. But yeah, these things have to happen in parallel. So I think, I mean, as an example, five, six years ago, when you went to a VC, all they wanted to see is, is some animal data that look nice. Uh, now, nobody you know, agrees to, to talk to you unless you explain how you're going to manufacture what you're planning to make. So that's a great, that's a great step in, in the right direction because you have to look at it holistically. And if you're trying to treat patients with something that can't be scaled or manufactured or with the cost of goods, it's not reimbursable, then you're going nowhere. But that's given. Yeah. But it's given. But again, a few years ago, no one was thinking about that. Now people are thinking about it very seriously. Yeah, I mean, I think we could probably spend a whole hour discussing <laughs> this this alone. But I, you know, I want to quickly move on to one other growing pain, I guess. You know, we all have, which is workforce. Um, and so, 
you know, I, 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 want, I know all of your organizations are addressing this as well, but if, if you could talk about like the key gaps and what you are doing to address this, and again, since we've been talking about connectivity and a coordinated effort, we, you know, discuss your thoughts on how as an industry we can have a coordinated approach to solve this. I can, can start. I, I think there are um, uh, some uncharted avenues for, for bringing employees in and um, uh, one that uh, we've taken advantage of is um, uh, transitioning the military. Uh, there's the Special Forces Foundation, there's an organization called Breakline that uh, places um, highly qualified, very um, um, uh, uh, competent people that are accustomed to following you know, uh, orders uh, and um, move them into, into industry. And uh, I mean, if you think about it, uh, if you're on a submarine and the, the uh, desalinization plant breaks, um, you've got some pretty good plumbers that are working on that or, or HVAC. Um, I think another, uh, trend, another component that we see is the migration of experienced GMP operators in pharma to cell and gene therapy because they recognize there's, there is a future in cell and gene therapy and they actually want to embrace that. Um, and uh, I, I think to your point, as far as you know, the, the, the focus on the patients, one of the things that has been common in, in our recruiting is that people want to make a difference. They want to bring these therapies to the patients. And it's, um, it's, it's foremost in their mind that they're doing something hands-on. Uh, they're closer to the patients than they've ever been, and, and that is, is very satisfying. Um, we've, for instance, this, this year up until September, we've been able to hire 180 uh, employees um, and onboard those, and many of them have you know, ex extensive GMP experience you know, from, the, from the pharma or the biotech. Um, uh, world. Um, so, you know, I think we're making efforts to establish, you know, a training academy and pulling in um, some of the uh, local community colleges to establish uh, programs for operators. And um, we see a, a willingness within uh, the broader community to, to support the movement into cell and gene therapy. Yeah, and this is something that Charles River has been doing a lot of, actually. You talk about um, facilitating, you know, actually partnering with academic institutes. So, you know, in our Memphis facility, we've been running an intern program. In our first year, we only had 14 applicants. This last year, we had 140, wow. with some coming as far away as California, even. So, you know, it's, it's definitely, um, I think, there's opportunities here to, you know, provide incentives like tuition reimbursement, um, you know, getting those academics. And I think another big thing we have to think about is do they always have to have bachelors or masters? I mean, I think a lot of times that's where we've been focusing on manufacturing um, personnel. But, you know, there might be programs that we can train them for an associate's degree in manufacturing, something like that. So I think there's ways to kind of tackle the... I, I just want to add something. Uh, we had biocentric. Uh, by the way, I have tons of op openings. If somebody is interested in uh, quality regulatory affairs, manufacturing operators, I don't uh, think you'll find manufacturing <laughs> operators. <laughs> no, they know people. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we actually pioneered this uh, almost six years ago. We launched this professional master's program in cell and gene therapy sciences for the first time in the country. And, and local university, and, and uh, organically we, we actually uh, train people, and then as soon as they graduate, they come and work for Biocentric. We have close to, I don't know, 10 of them or five of them, they work, work for us. I think uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the manufacturing, uh, but part that I, I think is very, very difficult to find people is in the quality, uh, quality assurance, quality control. Uh, these people are, are, are very difficult um, uh, to find. I think we have to have programs. Uh, we do have programs. We train, for example, Biocentric. We train big pharma people. Uh, we are in New Jersey, right? So J&J &J is there. Uh, uh, BMS is there. We, we train their, their, their employees. I think we just have to be very, very active in that area, too, as a CDMO, and, and make this as an offering. Um, for the companies to come and get trained.
because that will op also open up the door for us to collaborate uh, with them in process development, commercial production. So yeah, we I mean we um, we, we grew from zero to one thousand seven hundred people in two years. So that was uh, obviously that's a challenge, a lot of M and A, but also organically. So obviously hiring is a big challenge. I want to agree with Nick that. I think sometimes we uh, bring in people that are overqualified, uh, and and you know uh, I think that's something to think about, especially you know people who are executing in the clean rooms based on SOPs. I don't necessarily think that they need a master's degree, uh, but the other element here is I think that we need we need to automate. I mean we're just not going to be able, especially if autologous keeps growing, we're not going to be able to to sustain uh, the clean room space, the the people all those things that we're talking about. So we need automation and we need to reduce the, uh, the actual need for so many people executing the processes. Next five years. Hmm? Ne next five years, not now. Yeah, for, for the time. <laughs> Automate. We we're not there yet. I think we're not, we're not far. I mean, uh, no, both Nick not. and I, uh, you know, we worked on some things that I think we're getting close. But uh, you're right, we're not there. We, it'll take some more time. Yeah. So for the sake of completion, one more grant from CERM. <laughs> is that we actually fund undergraduates, uh, first of all, high school kids to learn this area, then undergraduates, and now we, re uh, we I guess, developed a new program called Compass for all undergraduates who need mentors to learn more about the area that they want to specialize in, so as to help CDMOs, help uh, also whatever position they'd like to attain in academia or industry. And, and when we talk about grants here, we don't talk about like 100,000, we're talking about like eight millions of these uh, or more. And so it's uh, very important for the state of California that we actually grow the next crop of uh, you know, efficient, highly trained, edu educated workforce. But I think that speaks to the fact that all those programs you heard from the others, maybe there's a way to collaborate again between what the people we train in, in education, but hands-on, maybe they can go to the CDMOs and CROs and learn how to do that as well. Sometimes hands-on is, is, is you know, as important as knowing the basics in terms of theory, et cetera. So uh, my cry to the team is, Let's work together to make this all work and do it now. And all the new potential technological changes that are going to happen in the future should continue. We need them. But at the same time, we need to actually manage what we have at our hands right now. If we stagnate, it's going to hurt the field. We need to continue moving and continue to deliver. I mean, there are now cell and gene therapy therapeutics on the market. How, what, how are they doing? What can we do to have them be better? Can, can we then uh, raise the next generation of products that go to market? Are they going to relieve the, you know, the same need or a different need? So it, it, all of those questions we don't have the answers to. But I think the only way we're going to do that is if we actually figure out how to work together. Right. Um, and I think that that's a, you know, consistent theme here at this conference and, and in, I mean this panel I, you know we, we work together with all of you a lot and appreciate it um, you know I'm looking I'm looking at the audience and the, you know how, how far down this list we'll actually get through but I'm gonna I'm gonna just ask you to give your thoughts on you know so where do we go from here what is what is the future of CDMOs look like or you know what are the most pressing things on your mind um, and maybe I'll start with you Hara. With me? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think partnership. I think we need to create a, a different model, partnership with the startups, biotech companies, and, 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 and that partnership can be, um, for example, uh, giving them discount and, or equity that you mentioned and resilience you guys are doing. Um, and, and, and also, um, uh, I keep insisting about this, technology developers, I think that's very important that we work as a CDMO, we work with the technology developers and, and, and bring the next generation cell processing equipment, uh, unit operations, and, and help them uh, to actually uh, showcase their technologies. Uh, we work with a bunch of companies. Uh, you mentioned 16, we have close to that kind of 
uh, collaborations to a bunch of companies, and I think it's very important for us to strengthen that partnership. So partnership with the uh, companies and, and come up with a different model to help them uh, help innovation, and also partnership with the technology developers to take the manufacturing of cell engine therapy to the next level. I, I think, um, well said. Uh, I think, um, and I'm old enough to remember making monoclonal antibodies in Charles River and in <laughs> mouse ascites. And I mean, if you think about that today, um, incredible progress has been made in, in industrializing uh, production of, of monoclonal okay. antibodies. We're very early with cell and gene therapy, and um, there is a, there, there is a rising tide of technology developers that now recognize that they have opportunity, and uh, that's based on the product approvals. It wasn't there before, and so there wasn't that investment uh, by the tool companies and the technology developers. Um, so it's critical. <coughs> excuse me. It's critical for us to partner with them in the industrialization of these processes. Um, and we're seeing migration from the regulatory agencies. We're seeing a willingness to, to uh, evaluate data across multiple sites for the approval of a particular uh, therapy for a rare disease, for example. Um, and I think um, it's important for us also to have the connections uh, with the innovators and that equity investment, that's something we're doing as well, and provide them optionality. Um, uh, we have a model where you can come in and work uh, with the, the CDMO for uh, development of your process, early clinical manufacturing, and then uh, graduate to having a facility on, on campus uh, that you control and uh, transition the, the the manufacturing operations from the CDMO to your own company. Um, and that's critical because these products can move very rapidly from, from early uh, clinical to pivotal clinical to commercial. Um, I, I think we also need to integrate with um, uh, the uh, sources of donor material, uh, the patients, the clinical centers, uh, to be able to adequately control the, or to manage the, the process of, of manufacture of those products and get them back to the, to the, to the patients. So I think um, there are um, extensions of CDMOs in the future that are going to be required uh, both early innovators and late clinical or to clinical uh, applications. Yeah, maybe I can add, uh, you know, I think that there are two things in terms of the evolution of CDMOs. So one is we want to a resilience right we're striving to number one create part longer partnerships and some things that are that are sustained and with aligned incentives and secondly a heavy and sustained investment into R&Ds and R&D manufacturing platforms right I think the tool providers obviously play a huge part in that but also uh, you know CDMOs that are closer to the actual manufacturing activities uh, need to invest in doing some of those uh, activities and developing some of those solutions internally but I think in terms of the ultimate evolution, I think where we see ourselves is we want to let the therapeutic innovation companies focus on developing the therapeutics, developing the pipelines, developing the therapeutics, having a deep understanding of the biology. And uh, let us, or our you know, equivalents, uh, focus and be the, the uh, experts and the bio biomanufacturing side of things, right? So that they don't have to bother with that, they don't have to deal with it. I will say that there's a, there's a fine line because I do think keeping some in-house uh, process development, understanding, and capabilities is important. But uh, starting as an you know, early phase, mid-phase company, trying to build your own facility and uh, qualify clean rooms and put in place all the regulatory uh, infrastructure, I think it's, it's a diversion. From the from the core um, goal, which is to develop uh, the therapeutics. Yeah, and I think I mean, Aton, you keep saying everything so eloquently. I don't <laughs> know if I can add too much, but um, you know, a couple areas. I, obviously, I think where CDMOs can help is really serve as that partner for one thing we already talked about is automation. Um, you know, obviously in manufacturing, evaluating those technologies, really understanding kind of what the next stages are. 
Um, therapeutic developers don't need to be doing that. That's something CDMOs can do. Um, you know, the testing, the release testing, how we can streamline that, make that more, also automate that as well. But also, you know, supply chain issues um, and logistics in shipping. So, I mean, these are all things that, you know, as a CDMO that we're looking at and how we can ensure that we have security of supply for raw materials. Um, we can continue to, to drive costs down there so that therapeutic providers can focus on developing the therapies. And again, I think that's where the CDMO partnership can really help the therapeutic providers. Mm -hmm. One of the things I want to add is that uh, part of our job is to also uh, educate innovators, the startups, that their process is not ready to go to clinic. They're so reluctant to get that. They think that whatever that they develop in their lab, it's ready to go to clinic. It's not. It requires a lot of process development. Tech transfer is not that you know, uh, uh, straightforward. So I think we, we owe it to them. We, we need to sit down and talk to them and explain to them that that requires your process is not ready for GMP manufacturing. Your process, your process needs to be developed further. And, and I think that's something that we have to work with them and, and educate the innovators as a part of the future of the CDMOs and how we can help them to innovate new therapies. Yeah, thanks, thanks for being the bad guy and saying that. <laughs> 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 uh, it is I, true. I, yeah. It is true. Huh? It is true in many cases, yes. I, I think CIRM has done a fantastic job in establishing the resources that are, can be available to innovators through their translational center. And, um, you know, they, they've brought expertise in uh, you know the the uh, preclinical, the manufacturing, the clinical uh, trial design, and that's incredibly valuable. Uh, it's it's limited um, to California, and it shouldn't be. I mean, there should be a resource that is uh, you know available to innovators across the country, and and perhaps I, I know that uh, there are collaborators that w that work and receive um, you know CERM funding. But it, it's a fantastic idea, and it provides, uh, you know, uh, mentoring basically to to innovators that are coming out of academic medical centers that don't understand the complexities of, of GMP manufacturing and validation and and you know uh, compliance. Um, so that's a model that I think has been very successful, and we should look to duplicate. Whether that's a kind of a consortial, um, you know, component that that would bring that. To, to market or whether it's, you know, uh, private companies, um, that's very valuable. And there are some, excuse me, uh, VC and private equity companies that are trying to do that. I think Deerfield in New York has an initiative, the Cure Initiative, where they're trying to take the, um, you know, the, the bright innovations uh, and provide that guidance and resource to, to, to advance them, and certainly to their benefit, they're they're benefiting from, you know, the successful progression of those products um, through their investment. Thank you for the compliment. Oh, you're <laughs> welcome. No. I, I just want to accentuate that CERM is open to everyone around the globe. It's not just California. Hmm. You can apply wherever you are t to CERM for clinical grants. Translation and discovery grants are restricted to California. But when it comes to clinical, whenever you're ready, coming to do pre-IND type studies, to do an IND enabling studies with like Charles River, et cetera, or other vendors, you are welcome to apply for a grant. You know, we've, we've had grantees come all the way from Israel, um, same different parts of the US, and uh, they've successfully moved to phase two, phase three. So uh, the restriction to California is that you need to have uh, a collaborator in California, and pr uh, you get more dollars if you actually manufacture in California. And that's why CDMOs would like to come to California as well as a way to expand the business, but also benefit from all the, what CERM has had to offer CERM is now over 16 years old and has had an impact really on the field. Uh, I'm a newcomer relatively. I've only been there since 2016. But a lot has happened in the field through a lot of effort that my colleagues in the past, the current ones and future, are really going to have an impact on. 
we have $1.5 billion dedicated for the area of neuroscience. So any project that's working on in the area of neuroscience can apply, again, for clinical anywhere from the world, but if not, if in California, you can apply for discovery and translation. Happy to talk to anyone who's interested. You know, I'm, I'm not a marketer. I'm head of <laughs> therapeutics development, and that's where really the, uh, the work starts in a heavy way, thinking about how is the patient responding to these therapies? Are, are we on track? How are we going to move them all the way to BLA and registration? And uh, it's a, a challenge that's been very well you know, thought, thought out by us relative to what do we do to help all these potential grantees to get to the finish line and for the FDA to allow them to uh, launch the product on the market. Yeah, I think, yeah. so I was just gonna add that I, th I think that uh, you know, CERN is doing a great job and uh, you know, our partnership with them is I think gonna be very uh, beneficial, but um, yeah, I think the structure where people uh, who want to start something, they have the funding or part of the funding, and they also have uh, the ability to quickly and efficiently access the, the relevant service providers to help accelerate and get on the right path. I think that's, that's hugely beneficial. And uh, also with, uh, with the new initiative, the federal initiative on biomanufacturing, we'll see where that goes. But yeah. I think there's increasingly an understanding, also as a result of the pandemic, Right, that we need to we need to figure this out. We need to have the technologies and the capacity. Yeah, I think that's a good, uh, good you know segue to take a pause because this room is full, and I know they they we haven't got to all the topics. So I want to give the audience to, a chance to, you know, if you raise your hand, you're going to get this cube thrown at you, uh, <laughs> and and you know I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. Yeah, there's one in the back first. Good morning, my name is Frank. Uh, I'm a physician and scientist, and I founded a startup company two years ago, uh, CDMO in the Cell and Gene Therapy, and I wanna thank our distinguished panelists for their encouraging and very uh, enlightening comments. Um, a lot, one of the things that caught my attention was the notions of breaking down silos between the CDMOs and maybe between the, the, the technology companies and the biotech companies. I wonder if you guys can comment on um, the future of maybe even CDMOs networking with each other. Maybe a, a, a well-distinguished CDMO that you guys are currently uh, representing with a startup company. Do you guys see partnerships and networks amongst the CDMOs instead of, of uh, competition amongst each other? Are you ready to work yeah. with me, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, you're, there, there certainly is the, the opportunity there. And you're seeing, um, for instance, in the gene therapy space, there's uh, an, an initiative to um, you know, establish harmon harmonization, uh, and, and the CDMOs are participating there along with the innovator companies. Um, I think there has been also uh, assimilation. Um, you know, if you look at um, aggregating uh, capabilities. You're seeing companies like Thermo Fisher and um, you know collecting um, uh, CDMOs and therefore removing some of that siloization. Um, there was a very effective consortium uh, uh, back in the day when uh, it was important to understand Chinese hamster ovary cells uh, as the basis for production of recombinant proteins and monoclonal antibodies. And that arose out of MIT, and there, there was a participation uh, across the, the field there that essentially shared very important characterization information and advanced the field. Uh, I think there's an opportunity for that, and um, you know, maybe, it's, maybe it's NIST that, that can, can collaborate uh, or can establish those consortia where CDMOs can participate and bring their uh, understanding of manufacturability uh, to, to, the, to the forefront. Um, uh, you know, uh, it is entirely possible uh, for us to collaborate, and, and particularly in the area of analytics. Um, you know, we all benefit from having common, well-established 
analytical methods that are able to characterize you know production and and to to bring that to to our our clients yeah, i think we're assimilating uh, by virtue of taking each other's people so, uh, <laughs> so that's so that's one point obviously but uh but on a more serious note uh you know this is happening as we mentioned earlier with clinical academic centers those partnerships i think it's going to also happen more and more with cro's cdmo cro's collaborating and the next step is, you know, between CDMOs. But we have to be, obviously, um, there's a path to go in terms of choosing what the right topics are and kind of what are the guardrails. Because at the end of the day, uh, it has to be a win-win situation. I, I think that there's an opportunity for CDMOs to collaborate with each other. I think I would put more emphasis on, on biomanufacturing CDMOs like us with the testing uh, analytical CDMOs that they offer <clears throat> services for testing our materials that we make. I think if we can come up with some sort of a, a partnership that they can expedite the process of testing and uh, sending the results back to the CDMOs and strengthen that relationship, that would be very, very important. We don't put a lot of emphasis on, on, on analytical and testing. It's very important, equally important. Actually, it's more important, in my view, because you can make garbage, but if you cannot test it, and, 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 and put it in the patient, uh, it's, it's, it's very crucial, it's very important. So I think we should focus on, on partnership between CDMOs and the testing CDMOs now. Because, by the way, two years ago, there was a huge capacity issue. Right now, everybody's building a CDMO. <laughs> everybody's <laughs> building a CDMO. And I think this is gonna be a problem capacity, everything else. So I don't think that CDMOs are going to be able to collaborate and say, you know, Alan, I have two projects. I want to give it to you because <laughs> I want to just take it easy. No, that's not going to happen. Yeah, no, there's another question in the front here. Yeah, with the interest of uh, the recent announcement on Biden on uh, increasing and safeguarding uh, the national interest in uh, biomanufacturing, uh, you know, what are some of the initiatives that you guys have done as a local manufacturers to really foster that, uh, you know, local uh, security in terms of data, like what you mentioned, uh, in order to uh, maintain that uh, within the U.S. market? I mean, it's, uh, it's in our name. I mean, the reason that we're called resilient is exactly that reason. So uh, how do we make sure that uh, initially uh, U.S., North America, but uh, later on, uh, you know, other geographies uh, are resilient in terms of the ability to quickly manufacture, scale, and supply therapies, right? I mean, we saw in the pandemic, uh, I mean, it was amazing how fast we got to, uh, to the vaccines and how fast we were able to scale and manufacture, but imagine it would, it would take half the time. How many, how many lives would we, we could have saved if that was the case? So, uh, yeah, resilience is, is, is critical um, and, uh, you know, it's the reason and to an extent for our existing, but uh, it needs to continue to evolve. Yeah, and I guess that's something that we're doing at Charles River, um, kind of pairing with the previous question is partnering with experts that we don't have. So, you know, we manufacture plasma and vector and cells, but we're partnering with, you know, antibody manufacturing and investing in those or RNA manufacturing. Um, so it's, it's, again, it's, it's kind of helping facilitate the growth of that manufacturing capability within the United States and also globally as well. Yeah, I, I think there's, um, you know, the pandemic created this recognition that we're very vulnerable. And, um, you know, we're interacting with BARDA, for instance, to, to establish uh, manufacturing platforms for uh, mRNA therapeutics and vaccines and, and um, but, but, you know, to Hera's point, um, there's a huge amount of, of uh, manufacturing that's going to be needed in the future. I, there was recently, you know, clinical results out of Germany, I think, where uh, CAR-T therapies were, were given to lupus patients. Mm -hmm. And it's the first real success in autoimmune disease. And if you think about auto, treating autoimmune indications, there are millions of patients that suffer from uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, you know, celiac disease, uh, even things as, 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 as um, um, you know, kind of minor as, as psoriasis. 
there are millions of patients that potentially are going to be recipients of these advanced therapies. And so um, there's going to be a huge demand going forward for uh, the manufacturing of these products. And if you talk to, you know, for instance, Steve Rosenberg, um, he believes that increasingly these products are going to be personalized. Uh, that uh, the personalization of, of therapies is going to continue. Um, and that doesn't suggest that there won't be allogeneic you know, products and solutions. Um, but we have to be prepared for, for you know, medical countermeasures. We have to be prepared for manufacture of these, these advanced therapies for a, an increasing number of, of patients. And you know, CIRM, for instance, funded uh, Matt Porteous's work out of Stanford which is treating sickle cell disease. Um, and you know the, the number of patients there, I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's not a small indication. Uh, so, so there's, a, there's a huge, gonna be a huge demand for capacity going forward, um, not just in the medical countermeasures area, but in, in production of these uh, critical therapies. Yeah, not to speak of solid tumors, right? I mean, as soon as uh, that's cracked, I mean, this, uh, the opening of the floodgates, right? I mean, it's gonna be. We could probably take one last quick question. Go back. Yeah. Sorry. So two hands. Oh, so yours first. It's classroom rules. I want to uh, respond to the comment just earlier there about uh, the need to um, be diverse and inclusive, meaning uh, right now, this field is amazingly diverse and inclusive. All different types of approaches are being tried. And we know what happens with success from small molecule and therapeutic antibody is it tends to squelch that and consolidate it very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we lose that. And we've already talked about how long it's going to take to truly build quality products. So could CDMOs be one of the players, along with the people that finance, that help maintain the diversity? Because that's going to be critical to really make sure that we're continuing to cast a broad enough net for all the potential indications that we all know uh, exist today. Okay, well, Charles, did you have a quick question? This one? Yeah, we, we, we could, yeah, we'll take that. Yeah, I would like to explore this more into the future. So in the next 10 to 20 years, what need to be developed and accomplished to make the feasible for most of the local hospitals can manufacture the cell and gene therapy product and to administer the treatment to patients timely and cost effectively? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. Can I answer? Yes. <laughs> I, I, um, I think the future would be a place of uh, care, uh, a, a concept that you can have actually modular facilities uh, being placed at medical centers, yes. hospitals, and also. Uh, Fully automated technologies like the Ori Biotech technology that's going to come out, or or Meltony, or Flex Factory, uh, being a very uh, technology agnostic, uh, putting some sort of a system right at the medical centers, and have them directly work with the uh, physicians. Uh, so that would be the future, in my view. It, autologous cell therapy will be around forever. The safety of that product. It's proven, it's a personalized medicine. I think allogeneic, uh, of course, if you can show, and I saw that phase two, allogen is doing the phase two for allogeneic cell therapy. I think if you can show the safety of that product, future would be allogeneic cell therapy, and we can actually uh, put some sort of bioreactor somewhere uh, and, and grow those cells and, 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 and make it available for the patients at the hospital. Yeah, I think it's, it's, I think it's all of the above, right? I mean, we're gonna see Allo, we're going to see auto, we're going to see centralized, we're going to see decentralized, we'll, we'll see point of care. But I think all of that's going to happen. It, it's going to depend on the, on the therapy, on the process, on how you know, critical the turnaround is to get the therapy to the patient. But uh, all that's going to happen, the question is how, right? That's the question. Uh, and I think a lot of it is through technology. And, and people are working on these things. I mean, we've seen there's, you know, it's kind of an oscillating wave, right? You see. The, the clinical data, and then the clinical data is there, and then you see all the uh, you know equipment and providers developing the solution to enable that, right? So I mean, uh, closed automated systems five years ago there there was maybe one, 
now you know we, we know about ten right that are being either either were launched or are being worked on. So I think it's a technology is going to be a key. The clinical data is going to drive that, uh, but it, but also the other aspect is the regulatory right. I mean the the, the regulatory bodies are going to have to uh, adjust and, and define best practices, for, especially for point of care manufacturing. Yeah, I think you know you could envision twenty years from now. Uh, centralized manufacturing of delivery vehicles, uh, uh, you know, genetic delivery vehicles, whatever that is, whether viral, non-viral, uh, lip lipid nanoparticles, <clears throat> and um, point of care administration of those therapies and administration of those therapies much earlier than uh, where they're being uh, implemented today. Uh, you know, the patient population, and it might be, it's going to be frontline therapy. And the patient is going to be the bioreactor. Uh, they're going to be the, the production vehicle. Um, and, and so I think we need to, I, I think we need to think about uh, the way that we manufacture going forward uh, and, and provide all this flexibility for these various solutions um, and um, encourage the regulators to have a, a policy uh, for licensure of, of these products based on aggregated distributed clinical studies. Um, and you know, down the road, our, our manufacturing may be very much simplified. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just think on a therapy perspective, I see it being more personalized. I mean, we're really, I think, going to get to the personalized medicine aspect. We might have like an aloe chassis, but then we really put the fingerprint of the disease for the patient into that chassis and deliver it. Um, so that's where I see it going. Yeah. Well, thank you. So, you know, lots to think about, and we could be here all day talking, but I guess we'll <laughs> let you go to the rest of the conference. So I just want to thank the speakers for their time. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. and. And we look forward to working together to improve patient outcomes here. So thank you all for your time, and thanks for joining us. Thank